Okay, so we've talked, we've defined some of the terms. Now, in terms of what happens when we actually start aerobic endurance exercise, so this is the point when you've kind of got out of bed, you've put all your training gear on, and you're leaving, and you're now actually going to start jogging. Well, what actually happens is a series of changes that occur, some of them overlap each other, some of them occur at distinct times. Now, they can be separated into what I would like to call four separate stages, M, M, A, H, okay? So we've got M, M, A, H. So this is a good way for you to just remember uh, what, what's actually happening in terms of the changes. Now the first change you're going to have is mechanical, okay? So you're gonna get a mechanical change in the body, and this is to do with the skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory muscle pump. Then we're going to get metabolic alterations within the body, okay? Now, we're going to get metabolic changes occurring in the muscle. Why? Because as we exercise, we need oxygen for glycolysis to produce ATP, okay? So we're going to have uh, an increased demand from the muscles for oxygen, so they're going to demand more blood flow, and we're going to get an increase in vasodilatation of the skeletal uh, uh, blood vessels, skeletal muscle blood vessels. Then we progress on to the autonomic changes. And to an extent, these two are related. Okay, so the mechanical changes uh, occur in a distinct manner, uh, but these metabolic and autonomic changes are, are related to each other, okay? Uh, and then finally, we'll have hum humoral changes. Okay, so we'll have the, the, the release of various hormones. Of course, the most important for the cardiovascular system is the increase in, in adrenaline. Uh, now, these humoral or hormonal changes will actually cause a supplementation or an enhancement of the, the nerve, autonomic nervous system, the effects that that exerts on, on the body. Obviously, these two combined are known as neurohumoral, I hope I'm spelling that correctly. Um, okay, so you've got your neurohumoral changes. Okay, so these are the four components that you need to think about when you go for a run. The mechanical changes, the metabolic changes, the autonomic and the hum humoral changes, the hormonal changes that are occurring within the body. Now what we're actually going to do is we're going to talk through each of these uh, very briefly um, just to give you an idea. So I'm actually going to just wipe the board, clear these away. Okay, and we're going to go first with the mechanical change, okay? So it's very important for us to know what's actually going on in the body. Now, in terms of the mechanical change, the, the easiest mechanism to understand really is the skeletal muscle pump. And you've probably all heard about this. This is, if you've done kind of GCSE PE or biology, you would have come across the skeletal muscle pump. Essentially, it's a series of muscle contractions, particularly in the lower legs, in the lower extremities, which propel blood in, in the veins uh, against gravity up towards the right atrium. So they increase venous return. That's what the skeletal muscle pump is. And we know that veins have uh, valves to prevent backflow of blood. Now, whenever we have a contraction, muscle contraction, we get a squeezing of the capillaries within, within that, within that uh, muscle, okay? So if I was to squeeze my bicep really tight, I'm actually getting blood going from the arterioles into the venules and into the venous circulation and then going back towards the heart. So basically any muscle contraction will cause a compression of the vessels and force that blood into the venous circulation to be returned back to the heart. And the whole purpose of this is to increase venous return. Okay, so the mechanical changes increase venous return. Now, the importance of the venous system is that 60 to 70 percent of our blood at any one time at rest is held within our venous system. Okay, so the veins are known as the capacitance vessels. When we exercise, the best way to get more blood to the heart is to, is to cause a contraction of the veins, which is what the sympathetic nervous system does, and we'll talk about that afterwards, or to cause contraction of the muscles to squeeze that blood back to the heart. And that's essentially what the skeletal muscle pump is doing as well. Okay, now we also have another pump, and that is called the respiratory muscle pump. Now this is a slightly more complex pump to get your head round, but once you do get your head round, it will make things a lot easier. Now, I've actually got 
a drawing here which I think will make things a lot easier. Okay, so what we've actually got here is a representation of what's actually happening uh, it, when we actually breathe in, inspire or expire, breathe out, okay? Now, we've got our chest wall, we've got the diaphragm, which obviously changes as we breathe in and out, uh, and then we've got the right atrium and the right ventricle. So this is the heart here, this is the inferior venous, uh, inferior vena cava bringing blood up from the lower extremities, and then we've got the superior vena cava uh, bringing blood from, from the, the upper extremities, and then we've got air going into the lungs. Now, what we can see around these structures is the thoracic space, okay? So this is the thoracic space, okay? And what is contained in this thoracic space is intra-pleural pressure. So thoracic space around the, the heart, the lungs, the veins which are attached to the, to the atrium, um, and then we've got the thoracic space which regulates the interpleural pressure, okay? Now, essentially what's happening with the respiratory pump is when we breathe in, we can see here, so this, this here represents the interpleural pressure, this represents the pressure in the right atrium. So before, before I even go to that, one, one of the most important uh, ways in which blood or any kind of fluid moves from one point to another is from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So essentially, if we want to get this blood in the, in, the, in the vena cava into the right atrium so that it can go into the lungs and then into the left atrium, left ventricle to the body, what we actually need to do is make sure that the pressure in the right atrium is lower than the pressure in the vein because then the blood that's in this high-pressure venous system will move into the atrium more easily. How do we do that? Well, when we breathe, so if I'm going to take in a breath now, What's actually happened is my rib cage has expanded, so my thoracic cavity has expanded, my diaphragm has flattened, okay, and I've now created greater space around these structures, the lungs and the heart, and that's dropped the intrapleural pressure. Okay, if you wanted to read a little bit more about that, you could, you could read upon Boyle's law to, to get an idea of um, pressure gradients in, in different um, um, spaces, okay? So by increasing the, uh, intra the, the thoracic space, okay, I've reduced the interpleural pressure. We can see that here, okay? Now, what happens here is that the atrium and the ventricle also expand. So the walls of those also expand because there's an increase, there's a reduction in the pressure, there's an increase in the thoracic space, and there's an expansion of the right atrium and the right ventricle. Now that allows blood to move from the vena cava into the right atrium, okay? And we can see that here, venous return increases. So it's a combi venous return via the respiratory pump is a combination of a, a reduction in interpleural pressure because I breathe in, my rib cage expands, my diaphragm flattens, and a reduction in the pressure of the right atrium and also the right ventricle. And that's what these red arrows are actually showing. The chest wall expanding, the diaphragm flattening, the heart getting bigger, you, get, you, you, you do get a, an enlargement of the vena cava as well, but the sympathetic nervous system is actually causing venoconstriction as well, lower down in, in the veins, okay? And then you're getting that blood going back towards the heart. So there's a couple of mechanisms which are working. But essentially, that's how the respiratory pump works. Now, one other thing that happens is with the diaphragm flattening, okay, so the diaphragm's now flattened, it's going to squeeze all of my abdominal muscles and the blood vessels within those muscles. And again, what will happen, those, the blood from the arterioles will go into the venules of those muscles and into the venous circulation, into the vena cava and back towards the heart. So this is an example of the mechanical changes that are occurring when we actually start aerobic exercise. And, and, and think about this because when you go for a run, one of the first things that happens is you get a change in your breathing pattern. You start to take deeper breaths. So it's a... You're doing that, so there's a big change, and that's the, respiratory, that's the respiratory pump working. That's the diaphragm going up and down, the interpleural pressure changing, the thoracic cavity changing, okay? And that in, combined, in combination with the skeletal muscle pump, you're then getting an increase in the blood returning back to the heart, so you're getting that increased 
stretch of the walls of the heart, the elastic band's just broken, so you get an increased stretch of the, elast the, uh, vas the, um, the heart walls, and you're going to get a stronger contraction, more blood going out into the systemic circulation to the muscles where it's actually needed to produce ATP. Mm -hmm.